Over the last two decades, Yu-Gi-Oh! has grown to become one of the most complicated, nuanced trading card games in existence. There are all these various strategies to implement, hundreds of unique deck archetypes that change the way the game is approached, and can play off each other in interestingly dynamic ways. An ever-evolving game of strategy and patience. Or you can play Solitaire by yourself. Now, for me personally, I've been playing Yu-Gi-Oh! since it first made its way over to the West. I got the first starter decks, followed the anime extensively, and was always checking shops for the latest card sets. Surely this random gas station on the side of the highway has the newest packs, right? For years, Yu-Gi-Oh! nurtured this love of card game mechanics in me and became the standard I would hold others to years after. Actually, the only reason I stopped actively engaging in Yu-Gi-Oh! was once they were no longer putting out the handheld games on the regular since that was the main way I could play it as someone growing up in small town Canada, where the local card game scene was Kaiser matches at the retirement castle. But after a near decade long hiatus from the game, Duel Links and Mass Duel have tricked me into getting back into Yu-Gi-Oh like some kind of nerd. And initially, I was put off by all the new mechanics they'd added since I had dropped off. I mean, what the fuck is going on here? Like every old man watching the news, I was scared by what I didn't understand. However, the more I practiced with the updated systems, the more I learned how much there was to modern Yu-Gi-Oh. From the speed of an average duel to the length and complexity of combos, everything has so vastly changed. Just trying to play a DD deck without an in-game automation system makes me feel like steam is about to shoot out my ears. Even the board the game is played on has been reworked multiple times over the last decade to accommodate all the changes that have been made. This is what the board used to look like, now it appears like it's been a victim of Pimp My Ride. For better or for worse, Yu-Gi-Oh! today doesn't remotely resemble what it looked like when I first started playing back in 2002. To put it in slightly different terms, it's like looking back at pro wrestling during the Territories era of the 80s and comparing it to modern wrestling today. Fundamentally, you recognize it as the same product, but in a practical sense, it might as well be a different beast entirely. And just like wrestling, old fans of Yu-Gi-Oh! will not stop yelling about how the version they grew up on was way better, and the new era sucks ass. What I'm saying is the Blue Eyes White Dragon is the Undertaker of Yu-Gi-Oh! Though, to be fair, I do get where that frustration comes from, seeing a game you used to play as a kid change so much. That might even apply to you. But what some might not understand is that none of these developments happen in a vacuum. Saito Konami didn't wake up one morning and make Nirvana High Paladin on a whim. These changes were informed by the game itself and its own natural progression. I think much of the bias for older eras of Yu-Gi-Oh! compared to the modern equivalent is that many are missing the context of what led us from Dark Magician on the Playground to Access Code Talker today. So that's what we're here to examine. And to be clear, this is not a dramatic history of the meta from the view of a competitive player. This is a casuals diagnosis of the game as it's evolved over the last 20 years. How did we go from setting a couple of cards and passing as an opening move, to doing a 10 minute combo to drop a full board of 3k monsters with multiple negates turn 1? When did we go from boss monsters like Black Luster Soldier to a troop of demonic theater kids? No, the other one. And at what point did card text change from a sentence of flavoring into the entirety of James Joyce's Ulysses? Well, after weeks of dueling the masters up in the mountains, reading every card Konami has ever printed, I've arisen to be the new king of games. So I'm here to answer the ever important question that's on everyone's lips. What the hell happened to Yu-Gi-Oh? To start where it all began. Early 2002, Spider-Man 1 is in the theaters, and How You Remind Me is top of the charts. Life is good. Back when the most complicated Yu-Gi-Oh! mechanic was figuring out what the difference between tributing and offering was. Now for most of you watching, I'm going to assume this is the era you got into the series. The anime had been airing Saturday morning for months now when the first booster pack set dropped in North America, and we were all psyched to be able to recreate these moments from the show on the kitchen counter with our friends. So many iconic cards and moments from our collective childhood came from that first season. Exodia, Red Eyes Black Dragon, Mirror Force. We were all playing like we were able to send Eren from Homeroom to the Shadow Realm if they lost. This was the game at its purest, before they added all these lame and complicated summoning mechanics. Yu-Gi-Oh! at its best, right? 
<laughs> Wrong. Yeah, if I'm being honest, this is the era of Yu-Gi-Oh that is hardest to go back to with hindsight. While I have a ton of nostalgia for that first year or so because it's when I got into the game, it's also when it was at its most primitive, because it wasn't initially designed for people to actually play. Going back a bit further to 1997, the earliest form of Yu-Gi-Oh we know now was originally made as a simple Magic the Gathering homage the late great Kazuki Takahashi tossed into his horror board game manga, alongside battle yo-yos and food poison roulette. As I mentioned in the 5Ds video, Takashi didn't exactly set out with the intention of making a competitive card game with an entire tournament scene built around it. He just wanted a quirky card game for his characters to play that allowed them to summon demonic creatures to traumatize the elderly with. But after hearing all the positive fan responses to Duel Monsters, Takashi chose to make a hard pivot on the series, refocusing the entire manga on the card game. And my clear bias aside, this was definitely the right decision, because there was something there worth digging into. Starting off with the basics, you had a handful of cards to play, there were monsters to summon that could attack your opponent or build your defenses against attacks, magic cards that could trigger a variety of effects to give yourself an advantage, and trap cards to counter your opponent's moves. An immensely simple design that allowed for an infinite amount of exploration of how all these mechanics could interact with each other. I don't think anything speaks more highly to the core of early Yu-Gi-Oh than the fact that these fundamental systems are still what we use today. Everything that's been added and changed over the last 20 years continues to be built around these original concepts. However, it took a minute before Takashi and later Konami, the eventual rights holders of the physical version of Yu-Gi-Oh, would piece it all together into a cohesive game and it shows when you re-examine that initial design. Namely in how it translated between the paperbacks of the manga to the cardboard of the physical game. Much of the Duelist Kingdom arc after Takashi shifted the series from the random tabletop games towards the Duel Monsters cards was trying to figure out what the rules of the game really looked like and how a story could be built around it. So solutions to problems often took what literary scholars have titled a fuck it we ball approach. At times the way a duel unfolds had less to do with intricate strategy and the way cards interact in a quantifiable way, like one monster having more attack than the other, but arbitrary systems that Takashi came up with on the spot. One of the conclusions to a duel is Yugi having his stone soldier destroy the moon to change the tide so that all the fish get beached. Like how do you even translate that into a card? It played less like a structured card game and more like a D&D &D campaign. Hell, they play a virtual D&D &D version of the game and it makes about as much sense. In terms of the actual rules of Duel Monsters, life points for duels were kept at a low 2000, compensated by the fact no one could attack directly. But this results in many duels devolving into one character summoning their big ace monster and the protagonist turtling in defense position until they can figure out how to light this giant moth on fire. There was also a field effect design to the board where monsters got stat bonuses if they were placed on the right habitat, which was eventually simplified into field spell cards once it was realized having game mats with different field compositions would be a logistical nightmare. To be clear, none of this is meant to dump on Takashi's early work, just that sometimes an idea takes a bit of refinement. Actually, looking at the series go from Duelist Kingdom to the Battle City arc afterwards, I think it's fascinating being able to see a card game figure out its own design ethos in real time, working out all the kinks as it goes. The first arc of the series was basically the beta test for the game, and the kids of Japan were going to be its playtesters. Now it's worth mentioning here that before we got our first booster packs in North America, the OCG, the version of Yu-Gi-Oh printed by Konami in Japan, spent the two years prior buffing out the game's rough edges. Originally, the physical card game actually looked exactly how the anime and manga initially did, where monsters didn't require tributes and you could play one spell a turn. That is, until they realized nothing was stopping anyone from playing Blue Eyes, Dark Magician, and Guy the Fierce Knight almost exclusively because they could steamroll through any other monster. If you ever wondered why characters ever bothered playing low-level monsters when they could summon something like Sujin for free, players in Japan had the exact same thought process starting off. Every character in the anime having one boss monster they could play instantly works in a narrative vacuum, 
but real life players getting their hands on the game put a stadium sized spotlight on the flaws of that original design. Playing this version of Yu-Gi-Oh, it feels like a boxing match where both boxers are just throwing giant haymakers hoping they land the winning hit. Not a lot of technical skill going on. Without having someone to script the entire duel, the game came off as incredibly unbalanced, where the winner came down to whoever drew their blue eyes first that the other person didn't have a trap hole to respond with. This is largely why Takahashi had to make later revisions on the way the game was played in the series. Because, after the first booster pack and starter deck released in Japan, Konami could see the card text on the wall and decided to put out the Expert Rules, the version of the game that we would come to know. Level 5 to 6 monsters now require 1 tribute off the field, level 7 to 8 monsters require 2 tributes, life points are at 8000 but you can attack directly if the field is open, and there's no restriction on the amount of spell or traps you can play each turn. The only limitation now was on cards Konami deemed too powerful to let players have multiple copies of, like Dark Hole or Raigeki, just as a way to keep the game balanced. It's at this point that the Yu-Gi-Oh we understand begins to take shape. Now with all that said, how did things work in the West once the game made it over here? It's the newest craze, Yu-Gi-Oh cards, and if you can get your hands on them, consider yourself lucky. Well, the first year or two of the TCG is the peak of the playground meta. Speaking from experience, the early 2000s was the wild west of trading card games at schools. Shit was wild. With Yu-Gi-Oh in particular, because the game was so poorly explained in the early anime since it was still working off the first draft of rules, and card sets initially didn't come with the revised rule books unless you got the starter decks, kids in the West were mostly left to figure things out for themselves. This led to many playing the game similar to the way the anime presented it, making up their own effects for monsters, summoning without tribute, and if you even attempted to explain what a limited list was, you were shanked in the cafeteria as a false prophet. With enough time though, kids learned how to read well enough that they could actually understand the rules. But grappling with the player base's own literacy wasn't the only struggle the Yu-Gi-Oh card game had at this point in time. For starters, and I'm sorry I have to break the news to some of you, but high-level monsters, specifically ones that require two tributes to summon like Dark Magician and Blue Eyes White Dragon, weren't actually as good as you remember. You were tricked by marketing. You're a victim of propaganda. While some may remember these as being the crown jewels of the playground, the reality is that once the expert rules were implemented into the game that require anything above level 7 to require two tributes to summon, cards like Blue Eyes went from the most optimal monster you could play to you can run one in your deck if you're that down bad to roleplay Seto Kaiba. And I do get that desire. Early on, few high-level monsters were worth the investment of two tributes since it never resulted in anything more than a bigger beat stick that might not even have better stats than what was tributed to get it on the field. Plus, since it was rare to have more than a couple monsters on the field at this time, dropping everything for a single monster made you more susceptible to a stray fissure or man-eater bug, leaving yourself wide open to get punished. And that's if you can even summon it at all. Trust me, having a strong monster to barrel through your opponent's board feels great, but if you never get the necessary tributes to summon it, the card just rots in your hand. Anyone who's played this game long enough knows that nothing gets worse than needing something to counter your opponent's moves and drawing a barrel dragon you have no use for. This is why when you check to see what the best deck builds of the time looked like in retrospect, it's a bunch of level 4 monsters with high attack stats, the handful of good effect monsters, topped with all the busted spell and trap cards, with maybe a summon skull or Jinzo for a bit of spice since they only required one tribute. That's because, as much as a monster having big number makes our eyes bulge like a cartoon character seeing a pretty lady, a deck being consistent is far more important. Something that comes up in a lot of discussion of what makes a deck good is the idea of consistency. Without going into an entire lesson plan about modern deck building theory, because god knows this video is already nerdy enough, what this refers to is how easily a deck can search or draw the cards needed for key combos you want to do. So in 2022, that means how efficiently are you summoning Baron de Fleur in your first turn, but for this era, it's mostly how frequently are you drawing cards that are consistently playable without a ton of setup. That slot machine plus 7 completed combo you put together might be good conceptually, but doesn't work in actual duels unless you build your deck entirely around increasing the odds you can make that happen. 
Again, this is why for the early years of the game, most of the focus was playing a pile of the best low-level monsters, because they were always playable no matter what situation, and all had their roles to play as you traded blows with your opponent. Speaking of consistency though, what about the other ways of getting out big boss monsters, you might be asking? In the anime, some of the most iconic cards of the first season of Yu-Gi-Oh! were the powerful fusion and ritual monsters Yu-Gi and Kaiba were able to summon, so naturally it'd be the same in the real-life card game. Like, if you could summon out a Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon or Black Luster Soldier, they were so powerful you basically won the game, right? Uh, well, that would be the case if either fusions or rituals were actually playable at the time. Let's start with fusions. Now, in theory, the idea of taking two monsters and fusing them into a stronger one was great. It allowed for a creative way of using your weaker monsters to make something stronger, fitting with the general idea early Yu-Gi-Oh carried. This is something distinctly unique to Yu-Gi-Oh as a card game mechanic. However, in actual practice, fusion summoning was too clunky to work with how it was originally designed. Needing two or more specified monsters and polymerization in hand was not consistent early on. You couldn't just toss a polymerization in your deck and hope you landed on it at the right time as an anime character would. It also didn't help that a vast majority of the early fusion monsters were what some might call stinky poo poo, only marginally stronger than the material used for them, so they weren't worth the hassle. It's understandable to build a strategy around a fusion monster like Destroyer Phoenix Enforcer, but Musician King was not it. This is why the only way anyone was using fusion monsters during this era was the moment Konami made cards that circumvented having to actually fuse monsters to pull something from the fusion deck, like Magical Scientist or Summoner of Illusions. Just think about that for a sec. The mechanic was so bad that players ignored it entirely right up until they could play around it. As memorable as fusion cards were, it took Konami years to get the whole smushing two monsters together thing working. But we'll put a pin in that for now. On the flip side, ritual monsters had the opposite but equally limiting issue. Ritual spells didn't require any specific monster to be tributed, just that their combined levels equal or surpass the level of the ritual monster being summoned from the hand. Yet again, something that works on paper, but then we run up on that pesky hurdle of hand resource. Between the ritual monster, the associated ritual spell for summoning it, you effectively needed at least three, if not four cards to summon out a monster that likely didn't have more attack than a summoned skull. They just weren't worth the resources needed. This is why Relinquish was the only ritual monster that saw play early on, since it actually had a useful effect and only needed one level to summon. Regardless, both fusions and rituals required you commit your deck to them like a mortgage you can't afford if you wanted to consistently use them, and even then you probably weren't getting something as consistent as the average beatdown build everyone else was running. So for the first few years, these frames were largely ignored outside of jank decks that wanted to play the funny burger. It might seem like I'm spending a lot of time on these broken systems, but I want to make it clear that pretty much every major design decision that comes later is rooted in trying to fix these issues. The tower might be leaning, but you gotta look at the foundations to understand the problem. Plus, it wasn't just the summoning mechanics that were unpolished starting off. A lot of card designs in early Yu-Gi-Oh, both in art and effect, were just throwing shit at the proverbial wall of illusion and seeing what would stick. It's honestly kind of endearing looking back at some of these cards in comparison to designs even a year or two later. You either had effects that were so wildly powerful they could swing the duel in the other direction, or functionally unusable to the point it was a waste of the paper printing them. Oh, I hit your monster with Zone Eater. Say goodbye to it after five turns. Not only were card effects wildly inconsistent early on, but even the way they were written was handled in a bizarre fashion, because Upper Deck, the company that ran the TCG in the West for the first few years, wasn't sure how they wanted to articulate what cards did. Initially, the idea was to avoid sounding too technical since that might turn kids off getting into the game early on, so they chose to go for a more casual writing style. The problem is that this often made what should have been clearly written out card text explaining what they do into a stilted ramble, sort of like your friend awkwardly trying to explain the rules of a board game they weren't certain of themselves. To top it off, there were no forums or YugiTubers explaining how cards worked either, so if there was a rulings dispute, you just had to fight it out in the sandbox. 
We lost a lot of good kids back then. Though, to be fair, nearly all of these criticisms are built with the power of hindsight. At the time, we didn't entirely notice these design flaws. We were all just psyched to play a fun new card game. Most of us just put together decks with whatever seemed to work and were happy. And that proved to be enough for Yu-Gi-Oh to become wildly successful in the West. Card packs were selling like hotcakes, and as the months went on and more sets came out, adding more fuel to the card pool, the TCG started to crystallize into a functional card game with a variety of decks and playstyles. You could strategize around burning out your opponent's life points with effect damage, you could focus on controlling the board with monster effects, or you could build a playstyle around milling through your opponent's deck in hand so they had no resources to use. It wasn't just summoning your best level 4 and holding a war of attrition against your opponent anymore. We were no longer monkeys beating each other with sticks, we were now apes hitting each other with hammers. This is when Yu-Gi-Oh! becomes a comprehensive game that players could be good at. What helped in the game's push for competitive play was the anime going into the Battle City Tournament arc. Once the card game the characters were playing started to reflect the rules in real life, it made it easier for kids watching to understand. High-level monsters require tributes, there was a consistent rule set, and characters had more complex strategies for their playstyles. I remember popping off as a kid when Weevil Underwood used the Insect Barrier Lockdown trick on Joey because I'd been toying around with the same kind of trick using DNA Surgery in my deck. We are finally seeing what this card game could be, even if the anime was still taking its liberties with how some effects work. Why can't the parasite feed on it? He's Gear Free, the Iron Knight, and that slimy parasite's helpless against his metal armor. And then there was the God cards all-powerful monsters that shook the very foundation of the game. If someone was able to play these cards, you knew it was over. Yu-Gi-Oh! would never be the same after these almighty beings descended onto the... Oh, no, no, not those ones. Those are also not great. Well, they weren't officially released until around 2011, and by then their abilities weren't that impactful compared to what decks were already doing, and that's discounting the fact it takes three tributes to even get them onto the field. Look, if I stop to talk about every overhyped anime card, we'll be here all goddamn day. No, while the Egyptian gods were running rampant in the anime, there was something equally game-breaking looming in the TCG. The Invasion of Chaos set that dropped in North America in early 2004 is when the card game took its first major shift towards what modern Yu-Gi-Oh looks like, as it introduced the Chaos Monsters, boss monsters that could be special summoned by banishing a dark and light creature from the graveyard. Special summoning monsters at the cost of removing others in the grave from play was already established as a way to add further complexity to Yu-Gi-Oh by making banishment a core mechanic, but chaos monsters in particular were something else entirely. If cards like Jinzo and Tribute Infecting Virus were gradual steps up Mount Power Creep, Black Lester Soldier, Envoy of the Beginning, and Chaos Emperor Dragon, Envoy of the End were cruise missiles. CED alone was enough to completely break the game, because not only did it have more attack than a vast majority of monsters, was special summoned for a stupidly easy cost, did a full board and hand wipe that also did damage to your opponent for every card sent to the grave, but players quickly found a strategy where they could lock their opponent out of their ability to draw afterward by comboing it with Yadagorasu, thus instantly winning the game. But after the Konami execs came down from their high and had their Oppenheimer moment, seeing the ramifications of unleashing the atomic bomb onto their card game, they raced to fix it. Thus, in an attempt to restore balance, the first ban list was made. Problem cards were no longer getting limited to one card per deck, but outright banned from competitive play. This was the first transparent example that Konami had zero idea of how the meta of the game would change, once they put out cards to the masses to break it. But fortunately, this was a one-off incident. Konami learned their lesson and would never make such a blunder ever again. <laughs> ever. And with everything fixed from there, the TCG finally released a state of equilibrium between new card sets being released that added further options to the game, and a bi-yearly ban list update to adjust for how the meta responded to those new cards. A delicate push and pull relationship between the player base and Konami, that could shatter at any second. And that leads us to 2005. The Yu-Gi-Oh! anime is nearing its conclusion, and with it came the Year of the Goat. 
Named after the most prominent deck at the time, the GOAT format is a specific time frame of the TCG that many herald as the greatest time to play. The culmination of the last six years of Yu-Gi-Oh! From the humble first sets Konami put out in Japan, to one of the largest card games in the world. This is the sweet spot of Yu-Gi-Oh! for a lot of old school players. Where the card pool is large enough to have a vast number of viable deck options with a variety of playstyles, but right before archetypes and extra deck mechanics start to become a dominating presence. Final Countdown, Pixie Control, Moki Moki Smackdown, Uguchi OTK, a plethora of options, and only one of those is made up. While duels could feel drawn out, there was a solid give and take to matches at this point in time. And since all the best cards were known factors, you were able to strategize on how to maximize your own deck strength while planning around what your opponent might be playing based on what you've seen, adding an entire level of mind games to the whole affair. As a credit to how nuanced the game already was at this time, more than 15 years later, players are still regularly going back to this format because of how much complexity there still is to it. That's why if you're interested in revisiting old Yu-Gi-Oh! or want to learn the game without jumping into the deep end of the modern format, GOAT format is probably one of the best options because there's enough interaction to be engaging without the intimidation of learning four different unique summoning mechanics that haul up their own specific systems. However, with all that said, every great era must come to an end and make way for the next generation. Now, if the last 30 minutes didn't make it clear already, the Yu-Gi-Oh! anime and the real-life card game have always had a synergistic relationship with each other, and this applies to every era of the series. Whether it's 5Ds, Zexel, Arc-V, or Vrains, the anime's portrayal largely influenced the fans' perception of the game and vice versa, so whenever there was a massive change in one, it was often reflected in the other. In the case of GX, it had the gargantuan task of taking up the mantle from the iconic original. With Takahashi passing the creative reins of the series to others, as he took on more of a supervisorial role over the franchise. And like most sequel series, GX had to fight its way out from the shadow of its predecessor starting off before it eventually made a name for itself. Cause I figure, if there is intelligent life out there, then let's teach him how to duel. In the same way, the card game was going through a similar struggle between 2005 to 2008. On the surface, it doesn't look like much changes with the game for the first few years of the GX era. Cards were getting a bit stronger as power creep gradually escalated and the speed of the game picked up. But everything was staying within the bounds of what the game was already doing. Most are still playing all the same staples they had been for the three years prior. But beneath that, the GX era was planting the seeds for all the major changes that would come after. And that's because Konami had two long-term design plans for refocusing the game. First was the push for archetypes, that being a family of cards that all play off each other with a particular playstyle in mind. Previously, Konami had toyed around with archetypes in passing, but nothing that really had a concrete playstyle or synergy. It mostly was just a passing, here's a few cards that do similar stuff with the same name, give them a try, sort of approach. But now you had Ancient Gears, a roster of machines able to stop your opponent from activating spells and traps during attacks, nullifying their ability to counter you at the last second. Or Cloudians that use fog counters they generate to trigger special effects. And Viacroids, did something related to cars? I'll have to get back to you on that one. Overall, archetypes were intended to push duelists into more diverse playstyles that had their own unique goals, rather than everyone playing the best 40 cards in any given format. Personally, and I know this might be a controversial take to some, but I love archetypes in Yu-Gi-Oh! While it might feel like it kills creativity in deck building, having cards that all have design synergy with each other, requiring less thought with how to put them together, for me, finding the nuances of those interactions in order to fine-tune a deck is one of the best things this game does. Plus, the fact they all share a design theme based on their playstyle that can tell its own story is just the cherry on top. One of my favorite things is when the archetype can accurately reflect their designs within the way they play. For example, generators are a group of godlike beings with names like Har, Generator Boss of Storms, that gets summoned through the boss stage field spell when your opponent draws, and then swarms the field with tokens that can be used for their effects. 
Put in simple terms, it's a playstyle where you're setting up a raid boss encounter for your opponent to get through, ads and all. Finally, Yu-Gi-Oh did the impossible, making an engaging MMO. The irony, however, is that while archetypes have become everything modern Yu-Gi-Oh is framed around, the first few attempts to push cohesive archetypes didn't exactly have a huge impact on the game, at least on a grand scale. Anyone who played at this time probably fondly remembers running Elemental Hero or Volcanic decks on their copy of Tag Force 2, but in the larger picture, few archetypes were as good as the pile of random good stuff players kept running. At most, people were simply taking select cards out of those archetypes and making their own strategies with them, which is where you saw some of the more clever deck ideas like Diamond Dude Turbo. Aside from archetypes, the other major change GX brought to the game was Fusion Summons. Well, to be specific, fixing fusion summons. As I mentioned earlier, up to this point, fusion monsters had been nothing more than fodder for magical scientist FTK combos, so Konami had been trying to revamp them to make them more accessible to the wider player base. And then one of the boys in R&D had the realization, what if we took one of those archetypes we've been working with and build it around fusion summoning? See, I know my two heroes aren't very powerful by themselves, but if I can form them together, it's another story. And I have just the card to unite them! Played by the main character of GX, the elemental heroes were intended to be a way to simplify the main frustration of fusions, being that you needed two specifically named monsters available to summon out a specific monster from the fusion deck. The way the elemental heroes dealt with this initially was by providing a more versatile selection of fusion monsters within the archetype, thus giving you different options depending on what you had on hand. So if you had Burstinatrix, Avion, Sparkman, and Clayman at your disposal, you had about three potential fusions you could go into depending on what you needed at the moment. It also helped that heroes had cards like Emergency Call to drag out heroes from the deck necessary for a fusion, and Miracle Fusion, which allowed fusions to happen using material from the graveyard. To Konami's credit, this did make a huge difference in how players viewed fusion summoning. With the amount of fusion card support that GX era brought, allowing players to do things like fuse from the graveyard, or even from the deck in the case of future fusion, people were now considering how to make use of this kind of tech in their decks. But it still wasn't quite enough. While heroes continue to be the poster child for fusion summoning with the sheer amount of support they've got, the first few waves of them struggled to make it feel as consistently good as the anime made them seem. And god forbid you didn't draw a fusion card when you needed it, because then you were stuck staring at a bunch of weak vanillas that couldn't do much on their own. This is possibly the reason that going into the second year of GX, that Konami started experimenting with the concept of contact fusion, allowing two or more monsters on the field to be fused together without the need for a polymerization card by sending the monsters back to the deck rather than into the graveyard. And gold star for the effort. It simplified one of the main struggles of doing a fusion summon while not completely breaking the game. The only thing they needed to worry about was making the premier archetype for this mechanic not garbage. So close. Yeah, like a lot of Konami's attempts to fix old design decisions, their first initial swing at contact fusions wasn't exactly a success when it made it to the physical card game. Not only did Neospatians have zero synergy with Jaden's e-hero deck that it was marketed with, but these contact fusions also required elemental hero Neos, a level 8 monster, to be on the field along with a Neospatian to pull it off. And if that wasn't enough of a hurdle to get a contact fusion through, the Neos fusion you summoned going back to the fusion deck at the end of the turn definitely was. Over a decade later, and I'm still baffled at why they chose to have this effect. Contact Fusion simplified the mechanic, but ended up creating a whole new set of problems that made them even less appealing. Trust me, I tried multiple times back in the day to make a Neos deck work, but it wasn't happening. But despite the lack of real appeal for the Neos Fusions, Konami seemed to like the idea of a Contact Fusion based archetype. So a year later, they tried again with the Gladiator Beasts. Rather than ditching the mechanic of sending monsters back to the deck, Gladiator Beasts refined the idea, where their monsters were able to tag out for others of a different name after attacking or being attacked, triggering effects if they were pulled out from the deck this way. And if you had the right ones on the field, could contact fuse into bigger hitters like Heraklinos or Geyserus. If not to prove the gulf of difference between the Neos contact fusions and Gladiator Beasts, while the former became a niche jank option for anime fans, the latter quickly took over the meta, even going all the way to winning the World Championship in 2008. 
This was the first time an archetype focused deck was able to do that. And this was during the most oppressive format of the time, the dreaded dad. Darkroom Dragon was a card that was released four years too soon, as it dominated the game for a solid two months with how powerful it was. To the point, many players were boxed out of the game by the invisible hand of the market with how expensive it was. So the fact Gladiator Beasts were able to rise up through it represented a fundamental shift in how players looked at archetypes and the game itself going forward. Between archetypes and contact fusions, it felt like Konami wasn't just trying to fix fusion summons anymore. It felt like they were testing something out. It felt like they were shifting gears. And now we arrive at the 5Ds era. Insert car games on motorcycles meme here. Now, I've already made my feelings about this era pretty obvious in the past, but this is one of my favorite times to play the game. If the GX era was planting seeds, 5Ds was harvesting season. Going from E-Heroes to Neos Fusions to Glad Beasts, we finally land on Konami's next attempt to make use of the Fusion deck. Though now it would be the Extra deck. After seeing how well Gladiator Beast Contact Fusion went over, Konami felt pretty confident in making their next step at utilizing the extra deck. Going, fuck it, how about if every deck could do that? So tuners were introduced as a sort of polymerization monster, that act both as material for the fusion and the card that triggers it. And by combining the idea of contact fusions with the level matching requirements of ritual summoning, we got Synchro Summons, a fancy new type of monster with a slick new white border. It's here that 5D set the standard with every new Yu-Gi-Oh! anime series going forward. From here on out, if you wanted to be the next Yu-Gi-Oh!, you had to herald in an entirely new summoning mechanic with you that would flip the game on its head. Because Synchro Summons radically changed Yu-Gi-Oh!, and in my opinion, for the better. For starters, it shifted the priorities of how the game was played. I wasn't just making a quippy pun earlier, the 5D's era of the game is when Yu-Gi-Oh! gets noticeably faster. With how Synchro Summons worked within the larger game, being able to quickly spam the field with weaker monsters that could be used for Synchro material became a prominent strategy. A monster's utility was no longer if it had a powerful effect or strong stats, but how quickly it could get itself onto the field. That's why Synchro Summons feel like the first true realization of what fusions originally were supposed to be that wasn't locked to a single archetype or a bad combination of monsters. A way to make use of weaker monsters by merging them together into something stronger. With the generic requirements needed for a majority of Synchro monsters, the extra deck saw far more use than past formats. And as we got more options in tuners and Synchro monsters, the more versatility the deck options were. Now any deck could slap in a couple tuners, and you had access to this whole toolbox of monsters to pull from. That's why this is also the era when a monster's level became significantly more important. Previously, the number of stars on a monster only mattered in the sense of how many tributes it required. Now, a monster being a level 4 compared to a level 2 could make the difference between a Black Rose Dragon and Ally of Justice Cataster. For that reason, being able to modify a monster's level also became a large part of the game's design, since it gave players more control over how they could access their extra deck. It might not be the slower, drawn out pace of GOAT format, but all these little reasons are why I personally love what Synchros brought to the game. It rewarded being able to plan out your combo routes efficiently to get larger monsters, while strategizing around what Synchros your opponent might try to get out on their turn because all it took was a tuner and another monster or two to pull off an upset, which added an entirely new level of complexity to the game and how you approached it. But the game getting faster isn't the only issue that starts to creep into the game from here. Now if you exclusively watch the anime, you might be led to believe that every new era of Yu-Gi-Oh! tosses out the old for the new as they rotate card pools that the characters use for the latest ones. And that makes sense. The anime is a glorified marketing system for the card game at this point, so you want to advertise what's going to be coming to stores near you. On top of the fact that I just watched Jaden play Heroes for the last four seasons, I kind of want to see what else is out there. So outside of the occasional legacy cards and cameos, a new series always means a new roster of cards that the characters play with. The thing is that this isn't remotely how the physical card game handles it. 
For context, many trading card games like Pokemon or Magic the Gathering actually do what the Yu-Gi-Oh! anime presents, doing what's known as set rotations, where after a certain amount of time, sets of cards will be rotated out of the format for new ones in competitive play. This ultimately makes it easier for designers to balance the game and keep the relative power of cards in check since they only have to count for two years worth of cards. With the knowledge, any frustrating or overpowered decks will eventually be phased out. Yu-Gi-Oh! on the other hand does the opposite. For Yu-Gi-Oh! every card ever printed that isn't on the ban list is legal in play. And at first glance, this might not sound like it matters all that much, but this is probably one of the most divisive issues in the TCG as it's a double-edged blade that only gets sharper as time goes on. On the one hand, not rotating out sets means your older cards don't become unplayable the instant it reaches toddler age. If you have an old hero deck from ages ago that suddenly becomes a lot stronger once new support for it's released, you're fully able to make use of it. This was literally the case in 2011 once heroes started getting better generic fusion cards and effect monsters so that they could compete with synchros. In fact, I'd say this is one of the biggest appeals to longtime players, knowing they can always go back to decks and archetypes that they enjoyed previously, especially if they find new things to add in to improve it. I had friends getting into Master Duel when it first dropped that hadn't touched the game since 2009, but knew the old decks they enjoyed playing in the past, so it made it easy to bring them into the game by giving them a more modern version of those decks to ease them in to getting dunked on by Eldritch Floodgate combos. The trade-over, however, is having to account for every card ever printed gradually starts to make designing for the game a bloated mess once you pass the 10-year mark. Trying to plan around the billions of permutations of potential card combos is nigh impossible when older cards are never phased out. This especially can become an issue when past cards that were specifically made for one era in mind end up interacting with new mechanics or changes in the way cards are designed. For the most part, this just leads to fun, unplanned combinations that players are able to discover. Like taking Dandelion, a card that creates two level 1 tokens on the field whenever it's sent to the grave, discarding it to special summon Quick Draw Synchron, then using it and the tokens for an easy level 7 Synchro Summon. These are interesting combos that allow players to get creative with how they put their deck together, as there's always some new interaction to discover. But then you have cards like Card of Safe Return. Being able to draw any time you special summon from the grave wasn't that remarkable when it was originally made in 2004, because on average you were only ever doing that once or twice per duel depending on what deck you were using. In 2022, however, you absolutely could not have that card in the game, because the graveyard is treated like a waiting room with how monsters are constantly coming in and out of it. The fact cards from past formats continue to be used isn't by accident either. It's not like Konami just forgets about older cards existing and keeps trucking along, because they also have an aggressive reprinting policy. Whether it's dedicated reprint sets or slipping old cards that are popular into newer packs. So there's always this looming tension that a past design decision is waiting in the wings to come back to break the game once the meta aligns just right. And it's a problem that only gets larger as the years go on and the card pool continues to expand. Plus, while allowing past archetypes and decks to continually remain playable might be great for nostalgia baiting the Yugi boomers back into the game, it does come at the cost that if your fave isn't popular enough, it's going to get forgotten between the waves of new Blue Eyes cards and the 10th iteration of Heroes. Over 20 years in, and there are now over 100 archetypes that all need to be supported to keep their head above water with the way the game shifts. Imagine a fighting game where designers have to balance around over a hundred characters, all with different gameplay designs, while continuing to add new ones. It would be a nightmare. But hey you Chaz Chads, don't you worry, we got more Ojama support coming. I bring all this up here because the 5Ds era is arguably the last point Yu-Gi-Oh could have reasonably considered implementing a rotation system. With the addition of synchros and archetypes becoming firmly rooted into the game, set rotations become less and less of a viable option, as it would require an entire restructuring of how they design and release cards. At this point in time, Konami have made a firm decision that this is how they would structure their game, meaning that the only form of control is the ban list, where Konami will attempt to wrangle the meta of the game whenever it's too out of hand, or one deck is becoming too dominant. Or at least that's the theory, the jury's still out on if that's how it works. No matter how you feel about the Synchro era though, it did represent the first firm step out of old school Yu-Gi-Oh. 
From here, the game has irreparably changed from where it started in the late 90s when Takashi first dropped the idea in his manga, and it's only going to continue to change. But while we still have another 10 years of the game's history to get through, I wanted to talk about these past eras first to demonstrate that this game has never been perfect. Takashi and Konami have been cobbling this game together as they go since the start. It's not like the game introduced one too many mechanics and it fell apart forever. But also, it never needed to be perfect. Every card game has its flaws, but what matters is the enjoyment players get out of playing with friends. That's always been what's great about getting into Yu-Gi-Oh, whether it's 2002 or 2022. Spending time labbing out decks with friends and getting excited about new ideas to improve your favorites. Takahashi initially came up with the concept of Yu-Gi-Oh to express his love for playing tabletop games with friends. So I hope he knew that he inspired that same joy in others for the last 20 years. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you all again real soon.